Um, right there, they're their own people. They have their own faith. They have their own calling and they have their own task. If we make them one-to-one, you are to be like Daniel, or in this case, you shouldn't be like those people who don't want to listen to God. Does that really work? Does, does that, is that really what God wants to tell you? Now, I think we need to be careful with it a little bit because we can throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's obviously some moral thing going on here, isn't there? There's something right and something wrong. But that's all in the context of people who are supposed to be in the covenant relationship with God who has said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it even after the flood, right? So um, when, we, when we begin to see that, then we're going to see it, it really makes Scripture um, bare. Um, to be honest to me, it sucks the lo- life out of Scripture. It sucks the joy out of Scripture. And then ultimately what you have is Jesus becomes the example. You should be like Christ. Uh, uh, Christ. And, and uh, again, this may ruffle some feathers, but it, uh, the problem would be, for instance, what would Jesus do? Well, the problem with that is Jesus would go to the cross. Jesus would die. Jesus would do miracles. And, and he, you're not called to do that. So, you know, the, the question would better be asked, what would Jesus have me do? And, and then we want to really open up the word of the Lord and understand what is God telling me? So the evaluation then is if I make uh, the people here um, in the Tower of Babel uh, the example for you, then they act and then God reacts. But we always want to see God moving and God always in control uh, of the events and God moving also in the story to speak to you about your life, who you are, where you are, the world that you live in, and how desperately you need Jesus Christ. So the evaluation then is God uh, responds to man, Arminianism usually, and as such this is a man-centered approach, or what we call anthropocentric. All right. So if you're hearing sermons, for instance, um, well one that comes to mind is when David looks at Bathsheba, right, when he's on the roof then I've heard sermons, a number of sermons actually, about how wicked Bathsheba was for being naked when David could see her. But the text never says anything bad about her, does it? The text never says that she was trying to seduce him. She was bathing. And that's what she did, right? So we'll never know 100% sure, but but in fact, a lot of people are, are, are even discussing that, that David, by what he did, this is, this is a, a clear sign of statutory rape, where you, you took a man and you abused your position to have inter, uh, intercourse with a woman that you had no right to have intercourse with. But to hear sermons, and I'm, I've heard that, uh, you know, that's why women wear sundresses, and that's why they wear miniskirts, and, and uh, uh, what did one pastor say? Men lust, but women lust to be lusted after, and in like 40 minutes of this, right? Is that really what the text was about? Or isn't it about how David falls into sin and that God still saves him and that from that union, ultimately, between David and Bathsheba is going to come Solomon and then Jesus Christ, you know? So we're going to go to number two then, the historical, redemptive, or covenantal reproach. So uh, in Revelation, you know, it says, uh, let, the, let the churches hear what the Spirit says, right? Have an ear for what the Spirit is telling us. What is Christ telling us? And so when we talk about covenant, we want to talk about that this is the context um, for which that, that, that the gospel comes forward. So the covenant is not the gospel, but in the covenant where God comes to his people and makes promises, and then fulfills those promises, and those, uh, those promises also come with a curse for those who don't walk with him, there is this marvelous thing called the gospel, the promise that the seed of the woman is going to destroy or the seed of the serpent, and then Galatians will tell us that's Jesus. All right? So all covenant comes to us instituted by God who first reveals himself to us. So we would say Scripture is theocentric. It's God-centered, not man-centered. And then um, 
when we, when we take that even, so I'm kind of working one and two kind of should, they're not necessarily linear. It's like one and two, those two work together, right? We seek for God after the way he's revealed himself. And in the Old Testament and the New Testament, he's revealed himself in the gospel in the one who is the word and his name is Jesus. So if we can find the gospel through examples that point to Christ, stories that remind us of the cross, uh, office bearers like we've been seeing that Elijah showed us Christ and Ahab shows us the Antichrist. Um, when we start working through all of those, you, you will begin to see Jesus all over Scripture and then you will meet this merciful, gracious God who is just and he is merciful all at the same time. So number three, in the response of humanity, we see how God executes his judgment. And remember, judgment isn't just negative. Judgment can be positive. God can judge his people to be doing well or judging his people to be doing evil. So in, in, thus we see that in, in uh, you know, um, Genesis chapter 11, that when mankind sins, God judges the sins. But then at the end of the chapter, there's hope, isn't there? There's hope and blessing. Now we can read Genesis all-knowing because we know Jesus Christ, so we know all the things that have accomplished. For the Israelites who read this in the, in the first, they're going, okay, what happened here? Oh, oh now we're reading the name Abraham. Okay, so now, now we're getting there, right? So you're always reading in the context you're in and with all the scripture that you have been given. And that's why one of the, when, when the Reformation happened, and it goes really back to Augustine, scripture interprets scripture. So even when you read the Apostle Paul, when Paul tells Timothy to preach the word, he's telling him, preach the Old Testament, isn't he? But he's telling him, I preach Christ crucified out of the Old Testament because that's all they had, right? So we, we want to rightly divide the word of the Lord, seeking God as he may be found. So I, I know that there is an interest, in, and I'm like that too, that there's something I like when the minister tells me what to do. Or if the minister says, you know, um, if, if you did this better, or here's how to, how to really be this. And there's a place for that in, in sermons. And in, in, if my, in a criticism, my personal criticism, my own sermons is, I think there can be and needs to be more of it, but not at the expense of the gospel. Because at the end of the day, I need to leave you not with what you shall do, but in whom you shall believe. All right? And so to me, that's the burden. That's why Paul says, I came to you with nothing else, not with eloquence, not with all this other stuff, but with Christ crucified. And that's from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So the connection between the people in the Bible stories and us, what is that then? And it's God. It's their relationship to God, their faith. We share that relationship. We share that faith. We share that word by which we are to learn from what God is saying and learn from what they did and then learn what God does in, subsequently to that. But that's where you'll find the connection. So Daniel is our brother. David is our brother. Bathsheba is our sister. And they failed. And there's nobody besides Jesus Christ who didn't fail in the Bible. They either died or they sinned and they needed to repent. But all the elect, all the chosen, fall into sin. And then Hebrews 11 works that out. But by faith, right? By faith they're righteous. And that's really the beauty of the story uh, of the Bible is, is no human being is a hero, you know? And, and that's true, right? Christians have never made posters of Samson or none of our kids have a, have a, a poster of, of King David hanging in their room or a, or a T-shirt, you know, of, of uh, Peter. That, that's just not what we do um, <coughs> because that's, for us, it's about Christ and it's about who he is and about our God. Number five, then, the gospel is Grace. And Christ is found in every event for all the Old Testament events are the preparation for Christ, for Christ is the Word. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh, and then in him we met grace face to face as we continue to go through John chapter 1. It's beautiful. So again, if Scripture interprets Scripture, then Scripture will also teach us how we are to read scripture. So this is why, what I give you tonight, right, is, is just a, a whet your appetite and that sort of thing. But this is why we, Richard is studying 
And, and that's why Pastor Greg and I and, and, and Pastor Jose have, have gone to seminary and, and done the training that we're asked to do. Because you don't just wake up learning this. I mean, some people have a natural gift, but mostly it just takes good hard work. And the more texts you preach, the more you can bring to the next text you, you do. It's also why normally what I've done since I'm here, right? We've gone through the whole Gospel of Mark, the whole book of Jonah, um, the whole book of Ruth, with some topical series in between. But generally, if you continue in the line, you're going, oh yeah, I got that story. That's why this happened. Okay, we're here. Okay. You, you can make the connections yourself. Um, and historically, the Martin Luther, John Calvin, Oxley and Pontius, all, all the men, Augustine even, we call that Lexio Continua. But we pick up the reading from where we left off. And then that way you grow and you get a sense of the whole book. But it also allows the pastor to grow the text in light of the whole book as well. All right, so um, to Genesis 11 then. This story reveals a God who had promised the preservation of the world, remember? So that's very important uh, in light of that. When, when these people sin again, and it looks right um, that they, they are sinful in the imagination of their heart. I mean, verse 6 says, the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And we remember that um, even after uh, Noah got off uh, from the ark, that, that we read that man is, is wicked again. And that mankind, um, you know, the, the idea that mankind is naturally good, it's just not there. And I hope to take that up next week where we, we see the five points of Calvinism, which really will give you a full sense of, of, of the, the richness of the theology that's in this story. But for right now, we'll start with there. When you're reading the story, and I'm looking at the people here and probably at home, I think it's almost impossible now for you to read the story the first time and think, God said he isn't going to wipe out those people, and the first thing they did was get wicked. So what is he going to do? He, should, he can wipe them out, right? He has every right, because they, they, I mean, they are in God's face disobedient. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. If God sends a flood, we can just walk up the ladder. We'll be okay. I mean, you, you talk about the arrogance of, of humanity, and especially in Genesis, there's that real sense that they know the God who they're talking about. I mean, if you, if you talk to a Muslim and then they call God Allah or, 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 or the Hindus or um, you know, whatever you have, there's still a, a bit of a sense of a removal, right? But these people, they know who God is and they're, they're, they're shaking their fist at him right after they, they know the flood story. They, they know that all of their, uh, the people of the earth were wiped out except for the, the six or, or eight that got off the ark and that their descendants all come from three boys. And yet they have the audacity to do this. Now, doesn't that help you understand the world you live in? Right? I, I think sometimes as Christians, especially in Canada, and then maybe I'll speak for myself, I just expect that everybody's going to behave like I do. So today we had some issues at, at, at the front of the truck, a church story with, with construction crews and stuff like that. And it, it kind of boggles the mind the way people treat you and, and, and handle this and, and their complete lack of joy in doing a good job. You're just like, how can this be? Now, I know we have it in the church, but, but I think we just work on the premise that everybody shares the same morality as we do. I think that might be in part because our, our world is very tight. We don't meet a lot of people. But one of the things that's been... Um, eye-opening for me and, and a challenge for me is, is people from the neighborhood and, and what they do and what they think is okay or they, de they never knew it was wrong. You're going, yeah, that's right, because no one ever told them. No one ever said, thou shalt not commit adultery to them. No one ever said, uh, honor the Sabbath day. No one ever said, go to church. No one ever said that sex before marriage is wrong. They just don't know any differently. And how can they? until somebody tells them, right? Um, 
but we also have, have a, a group of people, and we're seeing that partly in our churches, um, mainline churches that simply are saying to God, we don't accept your word. We don't accept that you created the earth. We don't accept uh, gender limitations. We don't accept what the word says about marriage anymore. They know God. They have the word of God, and yet they do these things. And then again, we want, oh, wow, yeah, but they still go to church and they're still Christians. Well, really? You know, don't, don't we need to be stronger with them because at some point isn't their soul at stake? I, I think the other thing that, that kind of weaves itself through the story is the impotence of the seed of the woman. Because Noah and his boys built that ark uh, and, and I know they were raised up by God and they had a special faith. So they, they really did do some pretty amazing work. And, and God protected them, right? But, and he used them. But now when we get into these generations, and we're seven away, right, from the ark at least, where are the godly? Now we do read that men began to call on the name of the Lord. And, and that was beautiful. And yet... Uh, it, it seems that, that the seed of the woman is silent, that, that nobody is saying, no, you can't do this. You may not build this. And I, I, what, what begins to happen, and this, this is one of the, the great strategies of Satan, is that when the, the majority moves into an anti-God position, how will the church function? What will the church do? How will we stand up? And then we come back to ourselves, don't we? And we say, you know what, but for the grace of God go we, because are we really courageous in standing up? In the, and, 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 and when God needs us to, we will. Don't get me wrong. I mean, don't get all hard on yourself. But there really is, is something in the story, isn't there? What happened to the light? What happened to uh, the church? And yet we see the, the, the remarkable wonder of the creation of the human being in the image of God. There's still something interesting in that, isn't it? These, how did they figure out how to make bricks and mortar? And how did they figure out how to build that base and then build base upon base to build a tower? And like we said last time, um, there's a tower that is dated in a similar time that's 300 uh, feet high. And they did that without, as far as we know, uh, pulleys and, and that sort of thing. How did they do that? Right? Painstakingly doing the work, but mankind still reflects that, that creativity of God. It, it's in us to do something, to work, to make something. And, and don't we live, you know, uh, we, we talked about um, the, the CN Tower, but, you know, YouTube, and we're doing this. I, I, I can be in here at 265 Albion Road and in your home with a seven-second delay. How, how can that be, you know, if, if you think about it? Because you can't see the ways. But even a simple thing like electricity, these lights are on, and we know there's wires on, but can you see the electricity zipping through the wires? Yeah, the, all this stuff, we kind of just, whoa. And I know we live in it, and you take it for granted, but don't miss that these people reflect the image of God too. They are a proof that God exists, even though they would never say that. But the only reason we would have a culture, the only reason that anything happens is because God has created people and they retain some of that uh, God image in them. And there again too, you know, when, when you're opening the, the text and you're, you're beginning to bring that out to people, what is God telling us? I made those people. I created the technology, and they used it against me. That's what's going on in the text. I gave it to them, and they used it against me. I saved them. They're alive because I didn't wipe out the world with a flood. And now they think they can do it? So, uh, again, we, we, we see the, the marvel of it. But now... The Lord came down to see the city the t and the tower, and, and, and we talked about the irony of that, right? Because the ziggurat is, is like stairs, so God, their pagan gods would have taken the stairs down, right? But God just, oh, now what are they doing? As, as if he didn't know all the time, but it's a beautiful way to engage you in the story. Remember, God's telling you something about himself, right? 
by the way, I mean, I didn't bring that up last time, but how did Moses know God knew that? God must have told them, right? God must have said, and Moses, when they were building that, guess what happened? We, right, because we, we talk about there, the Trinity is there as well. The Lord came down, and in verse 7, come, let us go down and confuse their language. So there we have that plural language again. So God is, you know, so here again too, the idea that, that God is in the heavens and he kind of watches and, and maybe once in a while he slaps a person here or throws a thunderbolt over there. God is intimately involved with the wicked too, isn't he? He's involved in everything. And, and, and again, you know, when, when we want to bring this up and, and when we bring it out of its, its context into our own context, that, that's where you want to find the application. Don't be too worried about COVID. Don't be too worried about the corrupt government. Be concerned. Be dutiful. Call your government to, to um, their proper place, especially in terms of, of you know, this ban on conversion therapy. Um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to, to preach the gospel and do some of the things that, that we want to do. And, 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 and that may be, at least in those cases, that we might have to overstep. Or, or we might have to step against, sorry, authority, right? COVID is a health issue. I mean, the, those are conscience issues. There, there's different things involved there. But um, when we start thinking about it, don't lose sense. And then we would go to Romans 8. All things are working together for the good of those who love them. So even this is, the, 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 when I'm pointing to this, that, that these people are wicked is working together for the good of those who love him. God has a plan, and this is part of his plan. And their sin, he can't be blamed for their sin, but his, their sin is part of their plan. To do what? To raise up Abraham, to pull him out. How? Through Terah. God is going to protect everything through Terah. So when we, when we start pulling it together, then... Um, Again, we begin to, to get uh, an understanding of, of God moving in the life and the history. So do you see that really all world history is church history? All history really is the history of the church and then how the world responds to the church. Um, and, and if we don't see it that way, then, then you, you really miss out on the joy and the wonder of history. And I know you'll never be taught that, and for most of us in this room, it's too late. We're not going to be taught that, that right? But, you know, for a simple thing, what actually, what was the cause of, of World War II, right? I remember in my history classes, what was the cause of World War II? Was it economic? Was it the Treaty of Versailles? Uh, how could the smartest group of people on the face of the planet allow for Hitler to come in? It was God's plan. It was part of the way God was working. Um, it, 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 was, it was part of, of the Lutheran church in Germany becoming weaker and falling away. Liberalism hits uh, Europe, and we see a weakening church. When you start looking at it from that point of view, the church is supposed to be the holder of morality. The church is supposed to be the holder of ethics. And when we're not, and we're not in our world right now, and, and then, then we see what happens. People go build a tower. People go, I don't want anything to do with you, Almighty God. All right, so see, these are the things that we're looking for when, when we do that. So uh, the providence of God, the sovereignty of God who's in control, the plan of God working towards that, that saving moment, but also um, the faithfulness of God. I am not going to destroy the world as with a flood. So now I'll confuse the language so man cannot be who he wants to be. And then, I think we pointed it out last time, but here that because it happens in Babel, uh, that is going to be the center of um, the anti-God, anti-seed, uh, seed of the serpent kingdoms. And to this day, even this past week, the Jews are still fighting with the Arabs. You know, um, Not to say necessarily that all Jews are the seed of the serpent because now we're the seed, uh, or the seed of the woman because now all of us were the seed of the woman find our yes and amen in Jesus Christ and that adoption. But what I mean by that is that, that that part of the world has always, it seemed, been at war, at contest, in struggle. And it's a really remarkable thing. So we are, um, back to the syllabus again, um, unity is doomed to fail. 
That's another thing. No, no empire has lasted, has it? And then we get Psalm 2, wherefore do the nations rage? Anybody who comes and stands opposed against your God will lose. So don't get overly concerned about Islam. Be concerned in, or in, in the sense of respect it. See what's going on. Parts of it scare us because in parts of the world they are doing terrible things to our brothers and sisters. But they cannot win the day. Thy kingdom come, your will be done. For yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and the glory. When you pray it, do you mean it? That's what the story is about. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Do you think Nimrod and his people could stand up to God? He went like this. And now they can't talk to one another. And now Israel walking into Canaan goes, that's where all these different languages came from. That's what happened. And now they're beginning to see that there are special people among all kinds of people. It's pretty amazing, right? And again, there's your contact when you're talking with somebody else, when you're talking to your kids. You can't bring all this, by the way, in a supper time devotion. But even if you would say, hey, kids, are we different than the rest of the world? You know, let's say the rest of the world is fingers. Are we like the thumb? Yeah, why, why is that? Well, let's, let me take you to the this, this story of the Tower of Babel. Because mankind wanted to be unified. You know, and, and by the way, when we get back to the, uh, back, when we go forward to the end of, of Revelation, what are we going to get? One world empire. They're going to try it again. And they tried again, too, with the European Union. It, it never works. And, and even if they get some sort of unity, God always defeats them. But kids, there, there's all kinds of people in the world. There's all kinds of religions in the world. But anywhere you go in the world, you will find Christians just like us. And we still stand because we are the special children of God. His mom and dad love you, so God loves mom and dad and you too. But you have to hold on to him. You have to love him. You have to respect him. Don't go the way of the world because there's nothing there. They will fall. And then finally that attitude of do you, when you read the story of Babel, find yourself in the victory? rather than in the sin. Do you see if, if we really spent a lot of time on the sin, and, and again, that needs to be, we, we, don't, we don't defy God. But when we see what God is doing, and we say we are part of that plan, we win. If God wins, then we win. And if we win, we will overcome all of that evil, all of that wicked, all of that thing that is around us. Just as Noah survived, Abraham is going to survive. Ultimately, we're going to find our yes and amen in Jesus Christ in that. The whole world is against Jesus Christ at that point. Rome, the Jews, the Greeks, Herod, Pilate, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, everybody except for a few followers. But Jesus is all alone on that cross, and he wins. And then he sends the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit starts undoing Babel. Satan, you can't stop me. Jesus says in China. You can't stop me in Canada. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. And the gates of hell is, is defensive in the sense, right? Jesus is busting through those gates and walking into Satan's domain and saying, these are mine, these are mine, and these are mine, and you can't do anything about it. Right? So to really get that sense of the power and the marvel, do you see why the text is so much more than morality? Why it's so important to not just say, do this, don't do that, as the old song goes, can't you read the sign? Find God in the text. And that's why we teach the kids catechism. Because in catechism, we teach them about what's providence, who created the heavens and the earth, uh, who saves us, what did Jesus Christ do, what is the power of the Holy Spirit. When we put all those things together, we draw from Scripture, give them a framework, and then they read Scripture and they can start pulling that framework out more and more and more. Um, and it, then, it, yeah, it really becomes a, a beautiful and a marvelous thing. All right, so that's why um, we go on then. We are all, just as mankind long ago there in Babel, in desperate need of Christ. Without God, without the Holy Spirit, we would do exactly what all those people back then did. We would not obey. But second of all, notice that nobody can save themselves. 
Interestingly enough, not one person in the story of, of Genesis 11, by the way, says, forgive me. Nobody says, Lord God, this was wrong. Because God's going to have to move in their life to get them to see it. So that even when we deal with Terah in the rest of the Bible, we'll read that Abram came from a pagan worshiper, which means that Terah worshiped God and his other little family gods. Um, and then we'll see that with Laban, and, 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 and that comes as well, right? So, again, it's, it's a powerful text there when we think the mercy of God. Would we have been saved if he didn't come get us? Are we so different than those people? Well, no, we're not. So God moves to diversify humanity to no longer do whatever they will do. That is, God will work until a person understands his need for a savior. And again, that's what you want to apply when you're teaching somebody out of this. This is what we want to do when we're preaching. You need Jesus. Yes, you need to be obedient, but you're not obedient. You need God to save you. And he saved you through Jesus Christ. And there's your natural way to get to the Christ in the text. So he works today. God works out today, breaking, the, breaking down the creativity of humanity <clears throat> so that we understand that man is like grass. But God does not leave man without hope. He provides the covenant line so that Christ may come. And we, of course, know Christ has come. And he has defeated sin by his spirit at Pentecost. We see how Christ now breaks down the barrier of languages and cultures as people of many languages and nations now worship Christ. And we too, having seen the mighty acts of God, must respond by running to him and resting totally in the Savior providing from him. When you run to Christ, you'll find the way to obedience. So again, another important text for me, both in when I was a school teacher, catechism teacher, and, and, and then as a, a, a parent and, and for preaching, from Titus chapter 2, it is the grace of God which has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Not hammering the law. And by the way, I'm not saying don't, there should be punishment, there should be consequence and all that when you're raising your children. But if we do it without them, but you, do you see why you need Jesus now? Hey, you know what? You, you really talked badly to dad right now. So we need to ask for forgiveness. And leading our children in that. And, and, and having them believe, if you really believe that Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, this is forgiven to then there's a reason to do better, isn't there? There's a way better reason to do better. Um, you know, and, 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 and we know that, that even grace, <laughs> you know, um, ask the kids to do the dishes, right? You feed them. You gave them a good meal. They probably even liked the meal. And then you say, well, go do the dishes. And they're like, why should I go do the dishes? It's his turn. You know, grace is a hard thing to learn, isn't it? You know, you, you, we would all love it, right? If one day our kid, can I do the dishes for you, mom and dad? That would be amazing. But it's not in them. It can be. But usually, and that's why we keep leading them to the grace showing them how that functions in our life, showing them how that functions in, in these amazing, powerful stories. And then you see that the story of the Tower of Babel is not really a, a downer story. It's a salvation story. It's, it's an amazing story of, of God and how he takes care of uh, sinners. So um, on the, right at the bottom then, uh, I, I've given you a theme. So what we do then is we take all of the things that you and I have done together tonight, and then we try to put it back into something. So the theme, there's different ways to do a theme, okay? One is to do a theological theme. So we could do God's providence is on display at the Tower of Babel, right? And then we could see mankind builds the tower. God frustrates the building of the tower. God moves so that terror comes, something like that. So you could do something theological, like pick a doctrine and, and work that doctrine out. Um, you could do something, my tendency is to do something where, where God is moving and saving his people. Um, and then, then there's also, you could do some more topical things with it as well. Um, if, if you were, you know, if we were in a, a, a time where, let's say, we were having a foreign nation or a foreign language, uh, sorry, foreign religion come in and really begin to dominate it, I might preach this sermon uh, and say, look, this happened a long time ago too. We can overcome. We, we can be 
um, strong in it. But you want at least in each way you do it, you're going to pay attention to the text and never make the text say what it doesn't say. And never ask people to do anything more than the text asks. All right? So you, you can't start adding all kinds of things. So I think you would see with me that I, I might be able to say the text is not inherently about cheating on your taxes, right? That God, the Tower of Babel, you know, mankind doesn't say they cheat on their taxes and man is, is wrong and that's why we're in such a financial mess. Um, the people of then, you know, balked against God and we might see examples of that today when people react against their government or cheat on their taxes, but that, that would only be to make an illustration. What is the text about? And I, I think um, that Yahweh might be better than God. The Lord destroys man's outward unity in preparation for true spiritual unity in Christ. So one of the things that um, Islam will do is create a whole series of um, do's and don'ts. So I'm going to end with this tonight because we struggle with legalism in the Reformed world. I think every Christian does. And what legalism does is it creates unity by an adherence to a custom, a code, and a law. So for the Islam, women have to dress a certain way. And if she dresses a certain way, she's Muslim. But is she Muslim in her heart? If the men all wear their beard uh, or, or dress a certain way and eat certain foods and, and um, don't eat certain foods, would that necessarily make them Muslim? All right? And we can do that in the church. So have to go to church twice on Sunday, uh, have to give your offerings, um, have to give, um, you know, to the Christian school, or you have to dress a certain way, all those kinds of things. Um, are, all, are some of those things good in themselves? Yeah, they're great. They're, they're fantastic. But the motivation should be because it comes from your heart. Not because if you do this, now you're a Christian. If you do this, now you fit into the club. Right? So there, there's also that. And, and generally speaking, most I would say all religions outside of pure Christianity works by trying to mold you to make you look outwardly to be what you may or may not be, right? And cults, of course, are the ultimate um, example of that. So the Lord destroys man's outward unity in preparation for true spiritual unity in Christ. A rejection of God's promise, God will never destroy the earth with a flood. Even though humanity has decided they will rebel against God in probably met many of the same ways they did in the days of the flood. God is going to keep his promise. You can trust him. When you got baptized and he said, I'm going to be your God, you can trust him. He will not go back on his word. He promised. Seed time and harvest. All of that stuff is going to happen. A response to God's wrath. God frustrates the building of Babel with Babel. All right, so now God is going to intervene into the history of the world to change the history of the world and, then, and what you would go on with there is now the whole world is filled that's why we have people in India and, and, and Pakistan and in North America before the Europeans got here or in Europe and the Chinese and the Japanese and the Koreans right and, and you have the Oriental folk and you have the Middle Eastern folk and you have the Western folk and you have the New World folk it's, it's amazing isn't it all these people and all these languages and where did they all come from and all of these languages, hey, comes here in scripture and Jesus Christ is going to break through all of it. And then finally, the reality of God's people. All, isn't what Satan's trying to do here? Satan is, is doing two things here, one of two things here. Either he's just trying to, to incorporate the church into wicked humanity. And don't forget that and, and, and this is really important when we, when we speak about the devil. The devil is not working so that humanity can have power over against God because he knows they all have to die and they know that anybody who dies against God is going to hell because he knows he's going there himself. So, But if he can incorporate the church into fallen humanity that is going to hell, he takes pl pleasure in that. That's what he's about. And that, that, that's, that's the problem with the deception in the world. They really think Satan wants them to have a better life. Oh, if I just had more money, if I just had a better car, if I just had a, a younger wife, whatever it is. And it's a lie. 
And then we get it, and then at the end of the day, you know, we're sitting there looking at the end of our life, and you go, oh, he got us, right? So, so that, that's the one thing he's trying to do, or he's simply trying to, to get God to destroy humanity right here, because he knows at least, and, and, and again, it's hard to know how much Satan knows of the future, but he knows at least at this point in time that... Uh, Jesus hasn't come, that the seed of the woman hasn't come. So what if he can get God one more time, like he did in the days of the flood, to maybe see, because now it seems like there's no Noah out there. Maybe he can get God so angry, God will just destroy everything, and then he wins the day. Nobody gets saved. Um, right? And then you get verse 16, uh, or verse 15, that Eber is born. Right? 14, 15, and 16. And then from Eber will come Terah and Abraham, the Hebrews. God knows exactly what he's doing the whole time, right? And, and, and he will keep that promise. The seed of the woman has to come yet, so I am not going to destroy the world. Dave Riggs and Mark and Ann and Homer and Linda and Jason and me, we had to get saved yet. So I can't end the world. God's not going to end the world yet. And there's, that's why he hasn't come yet, because there's still people he's saving. And so in the midst of this dark, dark world, God will work. God's people will be preserved. Christ will have his way and has had his way. And then we can live in the glory and the beauty of it. And that's how Paul would help us to understand that we can preach Christ crucified as the way, the truth, and the life, and as the way to live a better life, both in terms of our morality, <clears throat> our covenant obedience, and in, in the joy and the wonder of sharing the gospel with others. So this is normally better done with a group so I can talk and you can stop me and that, that sort of thing. Uh, maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll do this one more time with another text when we get to the other end of Genesis and if we have 20 of us then you guys can grill me and, and, and let me uh, have at it. But are there any questions in here? Anything that is it, was it too much? Does it make sense? And now do you see what I'm doing in Pastor Greg and that? that you know, we're not just coming up with this stuff. It, we're, in, we're really trying to engage with the whole Word of God from Genesis to Revelation with the Gospels in the middle. So, Jason, are there any questions online? Okay. Good. Then the Lord willing, we'll meet next week. Um, if you're uh, so inclined, take a look at the five points of Calvinism out of the canons of Dort. Um, otherwise, just remember that, you know, it's actually all tip, but it's tulip. Um, tulip's, uh, the, 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 it's easier to remember and it's easier to teach out a tulip. Man is totally depraved. Uh, God has... Um, uh, saved him with, with, with an unlimited, um, with an unconditional uh, election, right? He doesn't choose us on the basis of something we do. How can we know that? Well, man is totally bad. There's nothing he could do, right? And then we have limited atonement, but God has saved only a certain group of people. Die, Jesus died making, po Jesus didn't die to make salvation a possibility. Jesus made, died to make uh, salvation a reality for you and for um, the chosen, and then that irresistible grace, when the Holy Spirit comes and you're the elect, you're not going to say no. And then perseverance of the saints. Once saved, God will keep you under the day of your death or when he comes again in that saved, faithful state. So we'll show you how that works itself up also in uh, Genesis 11. So, Okay, well, we'll be praying for all of you. Um, it looks like we're going to be, uh, well, not... Looks like we're going to be in lockdown for a, another two weeks yet anyways, eh? So they're talking to June the 2nd. I, I hope they'll open the playgrounds up, and for you golfers, that would be nice. Even to open a basketball hoop would be nice, but uh, we'll see where we go. But we wish you the Lord's blessings. Let me lead you in a word of prayer. Almighty God, thank you for your word. When, when we dig deep into it and we begin to work with it, and uh, we see beautiful and amazing things, Tonight we saw your sovereignty, how you rule over everything, your providence, nothing happens outside of your control, your faithfulness to your promises to save us, to save a people, to preserve a people, 
And Father, also your, your uh, strength of character and your diligence. Uh, you do not abide evil and you do not put up with wicked men. And Lord, as we live in this world with devils filled and the world threatening to undo us, let us put our hope in the word Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord God, that uh, we would grow in him and that, Lord, you would provide uh, mercy and peace so that we may uh, really begin to live better lives in thankfulness for all you have done. For those who are here, Lord, keep them safe and bring them safely home. We ask a blessing for the Ascension Day service tomorrow. And we ask, God, that you will uh, give us your mercy and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.